the things we often talk about on this show is how to try and grow yourself spiritually and psychologically, ways to master our lives and perhaps even master our minds. One of my favorite spiritual teachers is Eknath Eswaran, better known really as a translator. I mentioned him recently in talking about his translation of the Dhammapada, a core Buddhist text. He's also very well known for his translations of the Hindu texts, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, various others. But he was a teacher in his own right. From all his work as a translator, also being of uh, Indian origin himself, he really deeply became involved in those things he studied and translated. I mean, he was the ultimate in practicing what you preach, practicing what you teach. And one of the things he was especially interested in was meditation and conquest of the mind. And he, when he writes about meditation, he speaks about meditation as a training for the mind. Often we see meditation as a thing in itself, a, an end in itself, which it could be. There's no reason why it has to be anything more than that. And indeed, many of the Eastern philosophies make the point of not being goal-oriented, make the point that it's our attachment to outcomes that is often half the problem of why we feel unhappy in the first place. But Iswaran talks about meditation as a training, a training in order to be able to change. He says that we can change. People often say, there's nothing I can do, I can't change it. And he says, there's everything you can do. That is the purpose of consciousness. It's the purpose of that force within us that seems to want to rise up and be something. Iswaran says, if we turn inward, we can remake ourselves completely, modeling ourselves in the image of the loftiest spiritual ideal we can conceive. Quite a powerful thought. We can remake ourselves completely just by turning inward. So clearly, meditation, which is perhaps let's call it the sum total of how we turn inward, is a lot more powerful than we often give it credit for. In today's show, I'm not going to talk about the hows of meditation, but maybe more the whys. I've often spoken about how to meditate. I'll mention some things in passing and perhaps one day in the future again we'll look at the techniques of meditation. But more importantly is to understand why we do it and what we give it what it gives us and how it trains our mind, how it trains us to conquer our minds and as he puts it, remake ourselves completely. The first thing that Aswaran reminds us about meditation is that it isn't easy. It's a training of the mind. It's a training of attention. It's not just, oh, you sit and do that and then just everything follows from it. And he frequently compares it to something like athletic training. Meditation is the warm-up exercise for the mind, he says, so that you can jog through the rest of the day without getting agitated or straining your patience. And he compares that to an athlete in training who trains their body in order to be able to run or do whatever they need to do. The training is the meditation, it's not the end in itself. And the training is, well, because the mind is the most powerful tool that we have in order to change ourselves. So he says, if it's so, then it shouldn't be easy. It wouldn't make any sense if it wasn't easy. Not because there's some universal law that says for something to be worthwhile, it has to be hard. That's not why. It's just simply that everything requires effort. He says the techniques of meditation are simple, but not easy. It requires effort, and like athletic training, can be quite strenuous. Most importantly, he points out, the purpose of meditation is not to achieve some remarkable experience, an aha moment, a profound realization, or even a connection with the divine. 
although those things can sometimes happen, they are incidental. The point of meditation and the reward of the meditation, the point of meditation is to master the thought process, to master the mind, and the rewards therefore come in the rest of our lives. In the meditation itself, we don't particularly benefit from doing that, we learn how to do that. In the rest of the day, when we have to use our minds, that's when we benefit. He says the more you learn to meditate, the, the stronger and more resilient your mind becomes, and the more able to challenge, uh, to face the challenges of life, the more able you are to become the kind of person you would like to be, loving, creative, resourceful, full of vitality. Meditation in and of itself does not produce those. It allows you the strength to create those in the rest of your life the way that we normally would. We still have to deal with stuff, but meditation trains the mind to be strong enough to deal with that. I think that's a distinction that is not often enough made. Whether whoever's teaching meditation, whatever school of thought it's coming from, it's often made out like the meditation is the ultimate thing. If you just spend hours in the day meditating, the more you do that, the better it's going to be, the more amazing it's going to be. And you know, while in principle, the more you meditate, the better, sure. In the end, if you spend all the time training and never apply what you train, it becomes a pointless exercise. And that's, I think, the point that people fail to make. So it's about training the mind so it works in the rest of our lives because we have to do the rest of our lives. And so that's why meditation is a training alone, the warm-up exercise. S1 uh, quotes St. Augustine, who said, I can tell my hand what to do, and it obeys. Why can't I do the same with my mind? And that's because it needs training. Even the hand, perhaps they're not the best example of telling your physical body something. But as we know, the better trained your physical body is, the better it can do something. You need to do exercise, you need to do stretching, or, or stronger exercises like than that, in order for your body to be able to deal with some things. And living in a world as we do, where resilience is more necessary than ever, in dealing with the many, many challenges, this really difficult world that we're busy experiencing throws at us all the time. Well, no wonder people feel depressed and powerless. It's because we, they, their minds are not strong enough to, to deal with it because they were never trained. It's like if you throw someone into a picking up heavy weights situation, obviously they can't pick them up because they were never trained. Right now, the world is a heavy weight. A lot of people are feeling it in their shoulders in their minds. And of course the missing ingredient is, well, if we were trained how to deal with it better, it won't stop the difficulties of the world. But it will certainly make us stronger and more able to deal with it in a way that doesn't crush us. Doesn't that make good sense? Well, as he says, the training is meditation. And when it comes to meditation, it's like any other fitness program. If you don't stick with it and do it every time, it's not going to work. Exercise does not produce any benefits if you do it only occasionally, or if you do it for a couple of days and then stop, or do a whole bunch of exercise today, like seven days worth in one day. Amazingly, you don't get seven days worth of results. We know from bitter experience that you have to exercise every day in order to see results. There is no shortcut. And Swaran says, well, then you should expect the same from meditation. There is no shortcut. Stick to it. Don't do a whole bunch in one day and then depre get depressed the next day and just skip everything. Keep on exercising. Whether it feels good or not, whether it produces a result or not. He says when it comes to physical exercises, if you want to become fit and slim, you'd have to do it every day, otherwise you won't get good results. You don't do exercise because it feels good. Exercise sometimes feels good, but admittedly, sometimes it doesn't. You can't then say, okay, well, today it's not feeling good, so that means I mustn't do it. 
The truth is most of the time it doesn't feel good. We all know that. It feels good in the beginning and then stops feeling good. We're not doing it because it feels good. We're doing it because it gets a result. So even when it isn't feeling good, you keep on going. And he says, if you want to be get a fit and slim, great personality, you need to do exactly what you do for doing that at the gym for your fit and slim body. Stick to it. Do it every day, whether it feels good or not. The way that he puts it, he says, if you want to see someone who will succeed, watch for the rare man or woman who takes pains over each small step, puts effort into it, and struggles through it no matter how difficult it is. Whether or not we feel like it, don't let whether we not or feel like it get in the way of becoming the best version of yourself. Isn't that a no-brainer? I just don't feel like it today, so I just won't be the best me. Once you realize that what, what you are trying to become, that it's a process of becoming, you accept that there's some days that are easy and good, and some days that are not. It requires effort, energy, stamina. Isoran says, over the, the years, I have made a rather surprising observation. The person who is relaxed, easygoing, laid back, may not be a good candidate for meditation. Such people may simply be, may simply not be willing to put forward the effort required to make difficult changes in personality or have the energy and the stamina to keep going when the going gets rough. To go far in meditation, we need to rouse all the energy we can muster and then channel it toward one overriding goal. And that is self-mastery, conquest of the mind. The, the form of meditation that Iswaran practices is the core idea, usually, of what Eastern meditation is about. And that's often called one-pointedness, keeping the attention trained on one thing. You hear about people who use mantras or a single image like a flower or the, the name of a guru or a god or something like that that can hold the mind in one place. And it's that ability to hold the mind focused on one thing that strengthens it for all other things. It gives it the energy and the stamina and the perseverance to deal with whatever the case may be. That's the form of exercise that we require. So the mind needs to be trained. He says at home, in meditation, at work, in moments of relaxation with family and friends, we can go against the conditioned caprices of the mind and gain little by little control of something which often seems nebulous and elusive, our own destiny. That is quite a powerful outcome that he's referring to. Going beyond the idea of resilience, he says we can control our own destiny. And that is because Remember, it's the Stoics that tell us we can only control ourselves. We have no control over anything else around us. And sometimes that makes us feel a bit smaller because, well, there's just little old me and what I have, and I can't control the world, so it seems as if I have very little that I can control. But actually, when you reframe it, as Iswaran does, as your own destiny, because this is still you going forth in the world, so it often doesn't occur to us that, well, that means that one of the things in my control is where I'm going in, in life, in the world. Other things might affect it. That I don't have control over. But me pursuing my goals, my visions, my aspirations, that is me in control of my own destiny. And if the only power I have, really, is the power of my own mind, well then, isn't that the muscle most worth exercising? Because it's the one that gives me control over destiny and therefore of any sense of meaning and purpose that I have in the world. So when the Stoics say the only thing you have control over is yourself, instead of reducing us to a small thing that has very little control over anything, you realize that reveals that we have control over everything that matters. Once 
we accept that energy and effort and stamina are required, we're one step closer to understanding how to achieve that control and mastery over our own lives. As Eswaran says, hard work is necessary in any field and nothing requires more intense effort than meditation. The hard work required to transform our consciousness so that we can swing attention away from the negative and bring it to the positive obviously must be a difficult job. We've got a tendency to assume that, okay, I'll get onto my spiritual transformation, my spiritual growth, and everything's wonderful from then. He says that whatever romantic notions we may have about spiritual growth, it never really happens in a short time. There's so much to transform. Naturally, there do come times when the mind gets tired and complains. Why not call it off for a while? This cannot be done. Essentially, it's like we're fighting a battle. And we're fighting a battle against the forces, let's call them, of karma, or of pulling us down into the material world, of tiredness, of despair, and of old habits, baggage that we find so hard to train, uh, to, to get rid of. So if you imagine that as kind of the enemy or the thing that you're trying to overcome, Iswaran says it's like getting into the ring and fighting that. Once you're in the ring, you've got to fight it out until you win. And that's the metaphor he uses. So think of it as a battle to build the strength like the battle in the boxing ring, which you can't just stop because then you're going to get hammered. It is, he says, a war within. We fight our samskaras, our bad habits, our baggage, our old stuff that is constantly fighting back. It is like the work required to make the miracle happen. When we take it back into life, we realize that Every moment in life is an opportunity to train the mind further. It's the same that someone who trains their physical body realizes that the purpose of all that strength is not only so that they can pick up the heavy weight or the heavier one the next day, but it's that in life when you have to deal with things that require physical strength, you have it. So in the same way, we take the training of our minds into everyday life. And as he says, every single moment of life is an opportunity to train the mind and to grow the mind. It's ridiculous to imagine that 10 or 15 or 60 minutes of daily meditation is the complete practice. Rather think of that as the warm-up, the warm-up for life. Imagine a situation where you're faced with an aggressive driver on the highway or an impatient um, ratty colleague at work or a kid who is loud and screaming and demand your attention. He says we've got a habit of responding in a certain way to stimulus. That we hoot at that driver, we, we get angry in return with the angry colleague. We tend to get into these patterns. He says the training of the mind can train us to step in between the stimulus and the habitual response and instead choose an empowered response. That is one of the things that training the mind enables us to do. It enables us to become conscious and it enables us to flex the strength of the mind that says, I have control over me, I have control over how I respond, I have control over my consciousness and I can grow my consciousness by finding a better response because it changes everything. When you respond differently instead of automatically to the stimulus, when you respond consciously and in an empowered way, in exactly the same way as the person who's trained physically responds to a bully who hits them or threatens to hit them, or if they're well trained, will they even get threatened in the first place? When you have a strong and powerful mind, people respond to you differently. They don't even need to discover that you don't get angry in response to anger. They just don't even get angry with you in the first place. It's the same as when we see a big strong person, we're not going to walk up to them and hit them. We'll find a better way 
So bettering ourselves can help improve those people around us as well. It's true that we tend to believe that we can't change. And increasingly, perhaps, in the scientific world, when we've discovered that so many things come from genes, more and more things come from genes, at first it might seem even more impossible, the idea of changing ourselves. And Isran says there are so many messages that we can take from people before, rather than, my, than believing that everything is genetic. He says, my body might be what my genes make it, but my character and my behavior are not. And he says, as proof, we've got the lives of great men and women of all religions and all ages who've changed themselves, who've thrown those claims to the world and transformed themselves from angry to compassionate, from insecure to unshakable, from human to divine. He says the message of their daily lives echoes down the corridors of time to those who have the ears to hear. You are not what your body is. Your real nature is spirit, which nothing can diminish or deny. Whatever our past, whatever our present, all of us have the capacity to change ourselves completely through the practice of meditation. The psychologist William James said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. And now we know, so much so, that meditation and other mind-body practices are actually capable of changing the expression of our genetic code, changing our health and physical um, well-being. We now understand how genes are switched on and off. They aren't just automatically all there at birth and boom, take it or leave it. And we know that there's so many different things, mysterious things sometimes like the mind, that switch genes on and off. And there's a lot of scientific research nowadays that demonstrates that as little as 12 to 15 minutes of daily meditation within two weeks, uh, sorry, within two months can demonstrate the expression, the change of expression of hundreds of genes. And that's uh, recent research that shows that. So in the same way that we change our physical bodies, we change our minds as well. And one of the most important ways to do that is to understand that everyone has that capacity in, within them as well. So that it's great that we're changing ourselves and responding differently to people. But he says one of the things that we can also do is change our attitudes towards other people and begin to see them as good. Whenever someone is unkind to you, and think to yourself about their good qualities. Think about times they've supported you. It takes practice. And he says your instinct is to do one thing, but take practice. When you're having trouble getting along with someone, Sit down quietly and recall how many times that person has been good to you, has given you support. Use positive memories to drive out negative ones. Because if you crowd out the negative ones, you can make a mob of good ones as opposed to resentment, which is generally a mob of bad memories. Resentment is a mob of bad memories. Isn't that interesting? Because think about it. It absolutely is. They crowd you and you suddenly thought of a million reasons and you've been mobbed. So create the opposite mob. Ultimately, there is a beautiful prayer from the ancient Hindu uh, scriptures which says, May all creatures be happy. May people everywhere live in abiding peace and love. For all of us are one and joy can only be found in the joy of all. He says, when you realize the divine self within you, you are launched beyond superficial living. You and your capacity to contribute to life are multiplied a million times. And as Buddha says, love the whole world as a mother loves her only child. Love like that will plunge us into our deepest consciousness and release in us the power to make a lasting contribution to all of life. Ultimately, we learn the strength of mind in order to be able to love. Because it all sounds 
easy and cheesy. It's easy to say, love everything and love everyone and everything will be beautiful. And we've heard that a million times for decades. And we know at heart, if only it were like that. If only it weren't such a difficult world. But if we continue to blame that on the world, which is difficult and which isn't full of love, then we remain powerless to change and change ourselves and do anything about it. The power lies within ourselves. And what Iswaran has taught us is that you need strength of mind in order to be able to love like that. If we learn that meditation and other mind-developing spiritual de uh, techniques are not an end in themselves, but they give us the strength to love and the strength to take our destiny into our own hands, then we understand how they give us the strength to change our lives.